Welcome to Claws and Carousels, which is my infinite pondering on advertising. My name's Elliot Starr. If you want to know a little bit more about me, you can visit my website, which is elliot.website. You'll be able to see there some work I've made over the years and my general outlook on the industry that I'm a part of. I'm a conceptual creative and copywriter which means I get paid to have ideas and to write words on behalf of brands, businesses, NGOs and charities, all with the idea of solving their challenges and overcoming their hurdles as organisations and using creativity to do so. Ultimately, whether you do what I do for a living now, you did it 50 years ago, or you do it in 50 years time, what that means is meeting the cultural energy and appetite with an idea that cuts through that's born from an ownable and desirable product benefit and that resonates, persuades and stays in the mind. And of course, you can use research to inform all three of these areas. For boring reasons, I need to let you know that opinions I express are my own and do not necessarily express the views or opinions of my employer. I want to start right at the start, which is where I'd start if I taught advertising to students full time and with what lesson one of day one of my curriculum would be, as it sets the context for the next 30 or so minutes nicely. And I'd start here, which is the rather timeless way we can divide the kinds of advertising and marketing that brands can employ. Now, this, of course, is a massive simplification for illustrative purposes. On the one hand, a brand needs to create meaning, and that is effectively built of awareness, understanding, and aspiration, i.e., I know the brand, I understand what it offers, and that's being communicated to me in a way that shows me a version of myself or my life I aspire to be or have. On the other, it also has to create conversion, and that is built of memorability, trust, and action, i.e. I remember the advertising, or I'm retargeted effectively, and in a way that doesn't annoy me too much. I trust the brand, and I take action to buy the product or service the brand offers. Now, the safest assumption one can make about any brand is that said brand is the least relevant, least important thing on the average person's mind. That is, if it's on their mind at all. It is then the job of advertising to manufacture awareness, relevance, and affinity. And it needs to happen in that order, especially in order for the brand to use all that energy to convert. It's very difficult to direct market a customer who has never heard of your brand. If I'm not aware of the brand, it can't be relevant to me. If it isn't relevant, I won't care about it. And if I don't care about it, everything else is academic. Exactly where and how a brand achieves this changes almost as often as the weather, but the principle holds. Now, for the bulk of the 20th century, if you had money to spend on marketing, your life was considerably easier than it is now. And this is true even if you had a mediocre product. So for the bulk of the 20th century, we had this medium called broadcast advertising. It was like this huge JCB digger claw and it allowed businesses to reach out into society and scoop thousands of new people into their brands and into a set of desired behaviors. And whilst broadcast advertising still has its place, we now interact with many brands in so many more places. And so it's critical for a person in any business with a product to sell to remember they are just like every single customer they are trying to connect with. And most importantly, to remember just how many different ways they now come into contact with brands in their day-to-day -day lives. My personal philosophy is to look at advertising and marketing less like the JCB digger claw and more like a carousel at a fairground. The idea here being that every seat on this carousel represents a different touch point between a business and a customer, a different opportunity to share your wares, communicate the value you offer, and attempt to hook someone into your brand. We've never lived in a world where people see advertising and then like zombies sprint to somewhere they can purchase the product that's just been advertised. But there was a time when we would see an advert on television, and if it was attention grabbing, memorable, and convincing enough, a few days later, we might be reaching for the product in a shop or supermarket. And this is still a true buyer behavior. We still do this, we still see adverts on television, and we still go to shops and supermarkets and buy them. But we can't pretend this maps perfectly 
onto how we are all behaving online because online things become more intricate. I even notice in my own behaviour now that the internet and social media and the modern forms of advertising they have spawned have all unlocked a greater amount of promiscuity in who I buy from. There's been a huge downturn in my brand loyalty. For want of a better term, I find myself flirting with brands and products more frequently and more intensely than ever before. And to that end, flirting with more brands in the same category than ever before. Some of these are still the household names that earned my trust years and even decades ago. But many are new brands for whom, thanks to social media, the barrier to entry in gaining my attention has lowered considerably. It's a stormy sea out there in the world of advertising and marketing. My philosophy for navigating it, and it really is only that, a philosophy, is that the better a business embraces this intricate new reality of consumer behaviour, the more successful it will be. The lines between product, brand and business are blurring more and more every day. Everything is a seat on the carousel. Everything is an opportunity to bring a new customer into the brand if you use it in the right way. Children generally don't chant slogans in the playground anymore. Now, that might be because adverts aren't as good as they used to be, but it might also be because marketers no longer have a monopoly on attention in the way they did in the 20th century. Now, our attention is sliced, diced and scattered across dozens of different media. So what's the result? The result is we need commercially creative ideas that genuinely better span these multitudes of media. What's more, we need a better understanding than ever of how people actually buy things and the journey they go on, from first becoming aware of a product and perceiving it to be better than their current choice, to the completion of the sale, the retention of the customer, and the generation of a repeat sale. There are no facts on the future, but my gut tells me it lies in commercial creatives fully embracing the customer journey and conversion advertising. What's more, using their creativity to increase conversion. This is as opposed to trying to make art disguised as advertising with little regard for its effectiveness, which has too often been the case. To quote David Ogilvy, if it doesn't sell, it isn't creative. But here's where this approach won't work. This approach won't work on mediocre products, because to parrot Scott Galloway, our newfound weapons of diligence make it very hard to sell these kind of products. Or to put it another way, makes it very easy for people to find out if a business is selling an inferior product. Good advertising has always made a bad product fail faster, but now our weapons of diligence mean it fails faster than ever. Where I think this approach will work is in using creativity to make truly innovative products famous and then applying an equal amount of and quality of creative thinking to the customer journey and to conversion advertising. But the claws and carousels analogy runs deeper for me. In the past, as a business, it was easy not to take responsibility for the world you were slowly creating by making your products the way you made them and selling them the way you sold them. If you weren't genuinely ignorant, it was easy to claim to be, particularly in a pre-internet world. Using that same analogy of the JCB claw, the narrative could be so simple, i.e., well, we just reach out into society and drop products into people's hands via our marketing. They're going to buy a product in our category anyway, we'd just rather it was ours. But now, in my mind, it's time for businesses to fully accept responsibility because everything they do spins a cultural carousel. The products they make, the way they make them, and the way they promote them. It all creates the culture we live in, and that creates the consumer behavior. The consumer behavior leads to particular purchase decisions and those purchase decisions inform the products businesses make and so the carousel continues. We might compare advertising and marketing in our economy to nitrogen in our air. Nitrogen plays an important role in the human body and advertising and marketing plays an important role in the capitalist economy. In both cases, perhaps not the most important role out tonight, but important nonetheless. Our air is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, yet our bodies are 3% nitrogen, 65% oxygen. So if we radically simplified things, which is what I'm doing here, we might say there's this massive oversupply of nitrogen in the air. And in the same way, there is far more advertising in the world than each of us needs to make informed purchase decisions. 
Advertising's omnipresent, and whilst it's ephemeral here today, gone tomorrow, due to its sheer volume, frequency, and repetition, it creates ripples in culture and ripples through time. And my philosophy is we have a responsibility for those ripples. A responsibility to try and build a better, more ethical, more sustainable, more progressive, and more inclusive culture. A responsibility to not only connect people seeking goods or services with their providers, but to connect them to better businesses, making better products in better ways. And in order to do that, you need both broad level and targeted marketing. To take you back to day one in ad school, you need to create meaning and you need to create conversion. I won't tell you exactly how to do that, nor will I tell you which tools to use because the tools are infinitely changing. But that always has been and always will be the very necessary job. A good example of this is a recent shift in marketing focus for Airbnb, who have been a performance marketer for a long time. I saw this headline recently. Airbnb's earnings surge following incredibly effective shift in marketing spend. So what did they do? What was this shift? The travel accommodation business's decision to cut performance marketing and increase brand investment two years ago is paying off with the move away from buying customers to education, boosting direct bookings and retention and helping grow profit. And also on this next slide, this excerpt from How Not to Plan by APG Group, which reads, Real people have more important things to think and talk about than brands. In fact, we often forget that the main reason people choose brands is so they don't have to think. Brands offer mental shortcuts that make purchase decisions quicker and easier. This was illustrated wonderfully in a brain scan experiment we saw. The study compared the brain activity of someone choosing between a leading brand and a weaker, lesser known brand. Contrary to what was expected, there was less activity going on for the strong brand than the weaker brand. Strong brands are literally no-brainers. That's why they're strong. So there's this wonderful challenge where a creative embracing of direct and conversion marketing is increasingly needed, while at the same time, it's very hard to direct market a product that hasn't caught anyone's attention and that no one has heard of. You have to gain attention. You have to get on people's radars. And a broad-level media approach is still a powerful way to do that and what's more has this incredible unparalleled signaling power that communicates a brand is legitimate i.e it's a proper brand but and it's a very important but if all you do is raise awareness it's like constantly making eye contact with someone in a bar but never actually starting a conversation things don't move along so yes creative minds need to better embrace the customer journey and conversion advertising but people still need to know what brands mean before they buy into them because our mind is a ruthless efficiency machine. Our ancestors are those who were risk averse enough not to do the stupid things that resulted in being eaten. So our minds optimize for what is safest and easiest, doing things that keep us alive and help us pass on our genes. So we spent the bulk of our time as a species in tribes and being in tribes has kept us alive. It's my belief that brands act as modern pseudo tribes. And the narrative goes a little like this. People that buy into and from this brand are this kind of person and have these kinds of values and beliefs. And so creating the brand meaning is and always will be important for people to belong to this pseudo tribe and to recognize its symbol, its language, the sort of people who make it up, the, an idea of the benefits of belonging to it, the idea of what we're saying to the rest of the world by belonging to it. And obviously it's important if we know people who are already a part of it. And that's really useful if they're famous. So creating brand awareness and meaning is and always will be important. The modern challenge, though, is that during their purchase journey, the customer will discover the best pound for pound product and thousands of other customers will help them make this discovery. And a huge amount of the investments you've made in creating awareness and meaning will be lost if I reach the point of sale to discover that over 12,000 people rate a product that's almost five times cheaper than yours to be only 2% worse than yours. So there are no facts on the future, but my best guess is that there's a successful future for better businesses, making better products in better ways, for better prices, and in marketers and advertisers embracing the idea of the carousel. That is to say, fully embracing and leveraging every single touch point they have with their potential customer and making them as creatively effective as possible. 
the future for overpriced, overclaiming, mediocre products is a bleak one. And the same applies to brands neglecting sustainability. Sustainability is a word that makes big businesses uncomfortable. But given the crushing reality of the climate crisis, it isn't going away. The cultural appetite for this is not disappearing. What does this mean for brands? Well, our newfound weapons of diligence mean we can investigate any brand's claims. And sustainability slowly moving up our collective agenda means we will. So whatever claim a brand makes in its marketing, it will meet the cold winds of reality and fast. A quick fact-checking conversation with ChatGPT, a quick search on a directory like Good On You, a modern customer will slice through your claims like Beatrix's Hattori Hanzo in Kill Bill. And if you read Vice's 2023 Guide to Culture, you discover this is more true of Gen Z than any generation that precedes them. The risks for brands of trying to get away with it are very real. Ethical considerations aside, there's reputational damage. Then there's a loss of customer trust and by default customers themselves. There's also legal liability and most painful, missed opportunities for real sustainability. Consumer spending is changing. Yes, harsh economic times always see a return to functional price sensitive spending, but beneath this, there's an undeniable cultural undercurrent. And it's one of not wanting to damage the planet any more than we've already damaged it. So supply chain, labor chain, raw materials, design and manufacturing process, circularity or lack thereof, packaging and distribution network, second life and recycling potential. These are no longer superfluous details of your product. They are your product. The modern customer will find out about them. What's more, they will attach the information they find to their perceptions of your brand. This is to say that my reaching for my wallet is no longer about the product you put in front of me and the brand code you wrapped it in. It's about how it was born and raised. It's about how it will die, how soon it will die, and if and how it can be born again. This is even affecting the luxury sector. Here, customers are now prizing qualities like sustainability, innovation, and purpose. They seem to be less concerned with exclusivity, prestige, and extravagance. This is in a sector where the narrative is about paying more for something in order that fewer people have it, not necessarily because the price has a strong correlation with the product's worth. All things considered, that is a tectonic shift. Sustainability isn't easy. No one's saying it is. As a brand, becoming as sustainable as you can is certainly a lot more painful than trudging along, being the business you've always been, while pointing at your competitors and saying, well, they aren't doing it either. But given our planetary predicament, it's painfully necessary, and the modern consumer knows it. So brands that lead by example here are sure to benefit. So where does this all point? This all demands a need for greater transparency and authenticity in advertising. The great thing about this is that combined with sustainability, it's a genuine advantage for scaling businesses, compared at least with behemothic businesses whose origins lived decades or even centuries ago. Customers are becoming more aware of the impact of their purchase decisions. They want to buy from brands that align with their values. Scaling businesses need to not only offer innovative and high quality products and services, but also show their commitment to sustainability and ethical business practices, and be able to back up their claims with evidence and engage in open and honest communication with their customers. This is not because advertising can or should save the world. This is because this is the way business should be done. When we also consider that our media consumption is becoming increasingly curated through streaming services and social media, while ad blocking is increasingly being adopted, it does signal the potential for a loss in the effectiveness of traditional advertising methods.
it also signals an increase in the competition for people's attention. Decades ago, an advert in the ad break of Saturday night television had to compete with other adverts in that ad break in order for it to lodge itself in your mind. Now, online films have to compete with, well, everything else on the internet. And that is if your desired customer doesn't skip it. So the future looks a little terrifying perhaps, but also a little exhilarating. I'm not an expert on artificial intelligence, but from what I've read, it suggests that the more businesses embrace artificial intelligence and machine learning, the more targeted, personalized, relevant, and effective they can be in their advertising. Not necessarily because the AI can do all the work for them, but because of what it can provide humans within the business, which is more robust data and insight to inform their advertising. And as we're already seeing with social media, a much more relevant media placement for brands. If the creative work that follows is of good quality, this should mean greater conversion rates. If handled ethically and intelligently, the aid of AI can mean businesses can also free up human resources to focus on sustainability and diversity, equity, and inclusivity. Whether or not they lean on AI, businesses that fail to do this will lose customers. Finally, it almost goes without saying that the creator economy will continue to influence the shape of advertising and marketing. Anyone with a phone and a social account can now be their own micro ad agency and media agency combined. And I feel this is going to meet with a generation of people who are far more ad literate, who will demand that advertising not only be more honest and transparent, but also far less obtuse. If you have any questions, please do feel free to email me at elliotstar.writer at gmail.com. My name has a fussy spelling with two L's, two T's and two R's in my surname. And please do email me if I can be of any help to you, your business or your brand. But for now, that's it from me. Thank you for your time. I hope this has been useful.